Um, these are the phonemic systems, the phonemic vowel systems of these three languages. And I want to draw your attention particularly to the front vowels. What we can see is that in English, in the very crowded and complicated for those front vowels. Notice that in Chinese, in contrast, there are only three vowel height levels um, in the front vowels. Dutch also has a good number, about five um, front vowels, but they're arranged slightly differently along this um, front, in the front, range, front vowel range, um, differently compared to English. So then when we look at the acoustic vowel spaces of Chinese accented English, and Dutch accented English. So we're looking specifically at these L1, L2 structural interactions and their impact on the acoustics now. We can see vestiges of the L1 structure in their L2 speech productions. So in particular, if you focus on the Chinese accented um, English, the acoustic vowel space um, over there, um, we can see that in their attempt to produce the five English vowel heights in the front vowels, they transpose their Chinese three height system onto their productions of English, giving neutralization of some of the important English contrasts. Now what's really important about this, there are two things. One is that this is, these are pairwise interactions, so these are structural interactions between the particular L1 and L2. And secondly, this is a group level feature. So this is something about Chinese accented English in general. This is not a source of systematicity at the individual talker level. It's a group level feature. Another source of uh, structural interaction that will lead to high systematicity of L2 speech deviations comes from, again, L1, L2 interactions, but these interactions are driven by typological peculiarities of the L2. English has many of these. Um, so, for example, English is a little unusual in that it has um, that vowel contrast up in the high back corner of the vowel space, so this is the contrast between U and U. Um, as you might get between the words, uh, the name Luke and the word look. Um, that's rather unusual. It's, an, it's a typological peculiarity of English. Neither Chinese nor Dutch has this contrast. And so when we look at the acoustic vowel spaces of these languages, of speakers of these languages as they try to speak English, we find that both Chinese accented English and Dutch accented English both show a similar neutralization of that English contrast in their productions of um, accented English. So here are systematic features of L2 English that come from interactions between the um, sound structure of English and um, the sound structure of the native languages. But this is, these are systematicities that will extend across L2 speakers from many different native language backgrounds. Now finally, a final source of systematicity in L2 speech production comes from features of producing second language speech that are general regardless of the L1 and L2 involved. This is just difficulties with producing a second language. And of course the most salient of these is speaking rate. So L2 speech is always slower than L1 speech. Here are two illustrations of this effect. On the left we're looking at a study of red speech um, so this is L2 English as produced by uh, native speakers and then you can see the substantial drop in speaking rate in terms of syllables per second for, L, for a group of L2 speakers um, from various L1 backgrounds. The data on the right come from a different study that makes, allows us to make two important points. One, you can see that this is a study that used naturalistic conversational speech. This was speech in real um, interactions between speakers. And this is important because it establishes that the slowed rate of L2 speech that we see in red speech is not a function of the difficulty of reading in a second language. We see this, slowed, this um, reduced rate of speech even in natural conversations. The other thing that is important about this study is that it, it was a very nice setup that looked at Spanish accented English as well as English accented Spanish, um, which allows us to see that this is not a feature of English. This is not an L2 typological peculiarity of English. This extends to other L2 as well. Okay, so what we've seen then is that L2 speech, despite being deviant, it is deviant from the L1 standard it exhibits deviations that are highly systematic. And these systematicities de derive from 
um, interactions between the L1 and the L2 that extend to groups of speakers. So we have um, the specific L1, L2 interactions that are specific to a particular L1, L2 pair. We have the typological peculiarities of the L2, which results in systematicities that are general across various L1s. And then we have language general L2 features that are general across any L1 and L2 involved in any inter interaction. So this sets up exactly the conditions that allows us to look at talker-listener alignment. These systematicities provide something to which talkers and listeners can align. They're, they're operating in a systematically structured phonetic space. So this um, also leads us to understand that in fact, L2 talkers, because of all these systematicities in their L2 speech, in fact, they share many of those systematicities, and so they're well aligned to each other. And this, of course, then makes the prediction that L2 speech should, in fact, not be all that difficult for L2 listeners to understand. This is actually a well-known phenomenon amongst L2 speakers. They often complain or often comment that it's easier to understand other L2 speakers um, than to understand L1 speakers. And here's one of my favorite quotes about this from um, one of the most famous speakers of uh, Czech accented English. And here's what he says. There's the kind of English that Czechs speak to Spaniards and Italians speak to Russians. And here you understand 100%. American English, you get about 50%. And then there's English English, of which you understand nothing. So let's see if we can um, show this effect in, um, in the lab. So here's a setup um, that is quite typical in the kinds of work that we do. Um, this is an experiment that involves presenting recorded English sentences to, in, to four groups of different listeners. Um, the talkers who produced the sentences were talkers from three different native language backgrounds. We have Mandarin accented English, Korean accented English, and then native L1 American accented English. And these sentences are presented to listener groups that include um, Mandarin listeners, Korean listeners, a mixed group of non-native listeners, that is, this includes various uh, speakers with various native language backgrounds other than Mandarin or Korean and then uh, native listeners, American English listeners. And the task is very simple. You just listen to the sentence, write down what you hear, and then we can um, score, the, score the responses and count up the numbers of words correctly recognized. So first, of course, let's have a look at what the native listeners do. And of course, the native listeners do best on the native talker. That's the green bar. They do better than the, on the native talker than they do on either of the foreign accented speakers. Um, but what happens when we present these foreign ac accented samples together with the um, native accented sample to these non-native listeners? So this is L2 speech going to L2 listeners. Here's what we see for the Mandarin listeners, the Koreans, and then all of the other non-natives. And what you can see right off the bat is that even though, of course, it's harder to understand second language speech than it is to understand first language speech, we've seen a disappearance of the L1 talker advantage for L2 listeners. And that's exactly what we would, would predict in the talker-listener alignment model, where it's all about alignment between the talker and the listener. And of course, L2 talkers are better aligned, uh, L2 listeners are better aligned to L2 talkers than our L1 L listeners. Okay, so that's what we just saw. L2 talkers are well aligned to each other. Now what about L1 listeners? And this is where I um, will refer to the, um, spa the phonetic space that we're operating in and the process of alignment as a dynamic process. Nothing ever stays still. The alignment between listeners is something that is easily adjusted. And so let's look at it. what we're predicting then is that L1 listeners can quite easily adapt to L2 speech, provided that they have sufficient exposure to the L2 speech. And note especially that this adaptation is made possible by the systematicity of L2 speech. It's very difficult to train yourself to um, adapt to random variation. Systematic variation, on the other hand, you can adapt to. Um, 
So we're going to look at results from a training study that involved two training sessions followed by a test session. Same task as in the study that I just showed you. In both training and in test, you just listen to sentences and write down what you hear. Now in the test, we present the, the listeners um, with first a set of sentences as produced by a Chinese accented talker. And then we present, a, present another set of sentences as produced by a Slovakian accented talker. During training, here's where we vary our different test conditions in a between subjects design. So we in the end have a total of six training groups, all of whom do the same thing in over two, ses two training sessions on two different days. And the training sessions differ by the talkers to whom they are exposed. So in the first test condition, we expose the talkers, they listen to sentences, different sentences from the sentences that they will hear at test. They hear sentences produced by the Chinese accented test talker himself. So here we're looking for talker specific adaptation. Can you adapt to the specific features of that particular talker? The second training condition exposes the listeners to multiple Chinese accented talkers. So here they're hearing um, this uh, Chinese accented English as produced by five different Chinese accented talkers, none of whom is the Chinese accented talker that they will be exposed to during test. So here we're looking for um, talker independent adaptation to features of Chinese accented English, which remember are systematic because they are derived from the interactions between Chinese, between the L1 and the L2. And then finally, we're going to look for accent independent adaptation, which remember we believe to be possible because of the language general features of foreign accented speech. And here we're exposing the listeners to multiple accents, so they get exposed to Chinese, Romanian, Thai, Hindi, and Korean accented English during training. And then they're tested on one of the languages, um, on an ac one of the accents included in the training, so Chinese accented, and then an entirely novel accent, Slova Slovakian accented English. So here we're looking for both talker independent, it's a novel talker at test, and accent independent adaptation. And then we have a few control conditions. We have one condition where they're exposed to a single Chinese accented talker, different from the, the uh, test talker. And this is to see whether the um, accent, the talker independent adaptation requires exposure to multiple talkers rather than to a single talker. And then we have two um, um, other, train, and other control conditions. One is just a task control condition where we expose the listeners to native accented English. So they just get exposure to the task, this test task. Um, without ever getting exposed to foreign accented English at all. And then we have a group of untrained controls. So let me walk you through um, the results. So first, looking at the results on the first post-test, the, the test with the Chinese accented talker. The untrained group provides us with, in effect, a, base, a measure of the baseline intelligibility of this particular to test talker. Here's how intelligible this talker's speech is if you've never been exposed to either the task or to the training with um, any kind of Chinese accented English. However, notice that what, from the trained, the um, control group that was just given exposure to Native American, in, American English speech, um, they did do better than um, the baseline condition with the, in the untrained control, which just tells us that there is a benefit of this task practice. Um, we're not particularly interested in that, right, um, in this study, but we'll take this as our baseline for comparison for the other um, test conditions. So we're looking to see if through exposure to Chinese accented English, you can improve in your intelligibility of um, a novel Chinese accented talker, and the improvement should be above and beyond the improvement that you get on the task just by having, um, by virtue of having practice on the task. If you're exposed to a single Chinese accented talker during training, in fact, that's not very effective for promoting talker independent adaptation. You do no better than if you've been exposed to English speech in the first place. Exposure to the test talker himself is useful. So here, of course, we see talker specific adaptation. You can adapt to a particular individual. But here's the really important result, which is that if exposed to multiple Chinese accented talkers, none of whom is the test talker, we find that you, you learn, you're just as good at the novel Chinese accented talker's speech as you are if you had been given the benefit of exposure to that talker himself. 
Now, importantly, we want to see if what the listeners have learned during this training is specific to Chinese-accented English. Remember, they've only, in this condition, been exposed to Chinese-accented English. And that's where the, uh, it's important to look at the Slovakian-accented test. And here we see no improvement on Slovakian-accented English following training with multiple talkers of Chinese-accented English. In other words, what the listeners have learned, what they have adapted to, are general features of Chinese-accented English in a talker-independent way, but in an accent-specific way. So this is talker-independent, but accent-specific adaptation. They haven't just simply loosened their criteria for word recognition of foreign-accented speech. They've learned something specific about the talkers, about what is general in the speech of the talkers to whom they were exposed at the group level. Now, what about the condition where we exposed the um, trainees to multiple accents? Here, they were exposed to a variety of different accents, which supposedly would have highlighted the, the features of accented speech that extend beyond the members of the same native language group. And indeed, here we see that they still do better on the Chinese accented English. And notice here, there was a Chinese accented talker included in the multiple accent group, and they still show improvement relative to the um, train, trained control group. Um, they do better um, on the novel Chinese talker. And notice that that is still better than the condition where they were exposed to a single Chinese accented talker. So a single Chinese accented talker, when embedded in a set with other Chinese accents, can be an effective um, promoter of this sort of um, talker-listener alignment. And then, for the first time, we finally see adaptation to Slovakian accented English. So when exposed to multiple accents, when the systematic features of foreign accented speech, as they extend across groups, of foreign accented speakers, um, when, when listeners are given exposure to that sort of variation, they can, in fact, achieve accent independent adaptation. Um, and this pattern, this general pattern of results, has been replicated a number of times now. Um, so let's just uh, see where we are here in terms of talker listener alignment and L2 speech recognition. Importantly, what we've seen is that L2 speech deviates from L1 speech in highly systematic ways. This systematicity then provides something for talkers and listeners to align to. And in fact, we find that L2 talkers are indeed quite well aligned to each other. And so we see sort of surprisingly good intelligibility of L2 speech by L2 listeners. We also see that because of the systematicity, L1 listeners are able to perceptually adapt to L2 speech. And in fact, we see highly generalized perceptual adaptation to foreign accented speech by L1 listeners. Um, so what I've been showing you are tests of um, foreign accented speech recognition in very sort of disembodied, um, non-interactive settings. All of the tests involved recorded speech, very neutral sentences, completely taken out of context, um, presented to listeners. In the last few minutes of this talk, what I want to do is ex uh, show you how talker-listener alignment also has an impact on communicative efficiency in a broader sense, when, when uh, interaction actually occurs. So to do this, um, we ran an experiment using a um, conversation elicitation technique that, di that involves the Diapix task. So this is a dialogue-based picture matching task that involves two participants. So you have two talkers. Each one has a picture. The, each talker cannot see the other person's picture. And the task is simply to work together to find 10 differences that, are, that exist between the two pictures. Um, now, this is a very flexible task, and there are many ways that this can be implemented. In our implementation, we wanted to get lots of opportunities for interaction and alignment for the, between the two um, participants. So we implemented this in the following way. There are some differences 
that involve an element that is present in picture A, but absent from picture B. There are other elements that are pe present in picture, a, picture B, but absent from picture A. And then finally, there are some elements that just involve a difference between the two pictures. Um, this is a difference in the color of the woman's shoes. So in this way, we get a, a very balanced amount of speech between the two talkers, and um, they are doing this while talk, talking through the task. Um, and then what we can do as a measure of communicative efficiency is just look at how long does it take them to complete this task. Everybody does complete the task with great success, but the, it can vary in the amount of time that it takes. And we can look at this in four different types of pairs, pairs that differ with respect to the alignment between the participants. So first we have two speakers who are well aligned to each other, two native speakers of the target language, so they're well aligned to each other and to the language of the interaction. Then we have an L1 and an L2 talker, so here we ha they're not aligned to each other and one of them is not aligned to the language of the task. And then we have two non-native speakers from the same native language background and two native speakers from different native language backgrounds. So you can see we're um, decreasing the alignment between the talkers with respect to each other as well as with respect to the target language. Of course, the native speaker pairs are the most efficient. They finish this task in the shortest amount of time. When you add a non-native speaker into the pair, the time to complete the task goes up significantly. But notice that when you have two non-native speakers from the same native language background, they're just as efficient as a native and a non-native speaker. And remember that the native speaker here is, is aligned to the task of the language, even if they're not aligned within the pair. When you get two non-native speakers from different native language backgrounds, that's the most difficult situation. And here we have the least uh, efficient communicative efficiency and the longest time to complete the task. Okay, so just to sum up, to sum up here, we have these systematic L2 speech deviations that allow for different patterns of talker-listener alignment. And we find that speech intelligibility, recognition accuracy, as well as communicative efficiency in interactive tasks seems to be quite closely tied to alignment in this very systematic phonetic space. So my final thought for you to leave you with today is just to remind us all that L2 speech communication, like all speech communication, is always a cooperative activity in which interlocutors are constantly adjusting their speech perception and their production, although I didn't talk about production today, according to the communicative conditions. It's not just a matter of how deviant a particular signal is, that deviance is only relevant in a particular context. Um, thank you, I just will end to acknowledge that all of this work, of course, was carried out with constant and deep collaboration with a fantastic group of postdocs and students and um, various other collaborators. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for a fantastic um, survey talk. We have time for questions. Thank you so much for the, for the fabulous talk. Um, I, I have a question about the accent independent adaptation. I'm curious, so you said for the talker independent adaptation to, for example, Chinese accent in English, you said the mechanism is really generalizing and it's mm -hmm. not just relaxing the criteria. Mm -hmm. um, but um, what do you what do you think the mechanism for the accent independent adaptation is? Yeah. Is that relaxation of the criteria? What do you think? What do you, what, what do you hypothesize the yeah. mechanism is there? Thank um, you. So we don't have any direct evidence that it's not just a general relaxing of the um, you know, just broad criteria of re relaxation in that particular case. We, ha we have the evidence from the other case. But I, um, so that's still a little bit of an open question. The mechanism that would underlie this, however, is exactly the, um, the, the um, 
sources of systematicity that extend beyond one group of um, accented speakers. So the sources of systematicity that come from the L2 typological peculiarities. So many of many languages will approach English in the same way simply because English is a little bit odd and it presents the same problem to speakers from different native language backgrounds. And also because of the language general L2 features which are independent of the particular L1 or L2, or independent of whatever languages are involved. So that does provide systematicity in foreign accented speech in general, in foreign accented English in general, that the listeners could be using to, under, um, you know, to drive this perceptual adaptation. That's the idea. Otis. Thank you, that was very interesting. Um, I have a question about your last experiment, the Diapix uh, task. Mm -hmm. Um, so in the previous experiments that you talked about, you can sort of control for the uh, level of, of the accent, so the, the strength of the accent, but in the diapix task, that's probably a bit more difficult than pronunciation in the, and um, um, how good you are in the language will probably play a role as well. So can you say some, something about that? Um, you mean proficiency in the L2 more broadly construed than just in terms of their well, phonetics? Both. So both proficiency, because if you don't know the word or if you, if you have trouble building up the sentences that will yes. impair the communication and also the level of, of accent. Um, yeah, I mean, we, um, so let's see, what can I say about that? Well, first of all, these are, these are averages over groups. So there is quite a bit of, then you could see, I mean, there was a lot of variation. Um, the speakers are, they do vary in their proficiency. They do vary in their vocabulary a lot. And so um, some of them find the task quite a bit easier to perform than others. Um, they never, I mean, so when we look at the, that was just one measure, the time to complete the task. There are other ways that we can look at communicative efficiency that might um, reveal finer grain differences between the individual talkers and, and the different groups. So for example, we have also looked at um, word type to token ratio. So um, that is a, that's a measure of efficiency. You know, how many times do you, do you need to repeat a particular word to get the meaning across? And, and we find sort of a similar pattern. Um, I can actually show you that data, although I think we're running out of time, so I won't do that. But um, as you go across the groups and the um, decrease in talker-listener alignment, we find a decrease in um, the efficiency of the to type to token ratio of the individual words that they use. So you see these, these measures of communicative efficiency um, across all measures of linguistic performance. I mean, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Partially, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, because it, it's clear there is, there's quite a range of, yes. of, of um, yes. proficiency. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, and, and so I'm wondering whether it's I mean, possible to do like a post hoc analysis of the, the degree of accentedness or proficiency or whatever, yeah. and see whether that correlates with between the, whether, whether it correlates between the groups and with the performance measure that you've used. Yeah, um, I, actually, so let me just say one thing about proficiency of these particular talkers. They're, they're, actually, they're, they're all at about a similar level of proficiency. They're all incoming graduate students to Northwestern University. So, I mean, there is a range in there, but then it's not a huge range. The biggest range is, um, the range that you were seeing was, of course, in time to complete the task with their pair. Um, yeah, so that's just, just a comment about the, the proficiency, yeah. Okay, I think we have to stop here. Uh, I would like to get, go to one of the organizers. Well, thank you very much again for a really wonderful uh, talk. Thanks from the Interspeech uh, Organizing Committee and from an L2 speaker uh, of English. So uh, thank you very much and congratulations. And uh, I hope this is a small memory to this wonderful talk. Thank you very much.